welcome everyone. My name is Mike Kimhenna. I'm going to be interviewing and hosting this evening's talk. Our special guest is Fadi Kathan, Franco-Palestinian chef and hotelier, um, has become the voice of modern Palestinian cuisine. When Fadi started his Fauda restaurant in 2016, he created a cuisine honoring Palestine's best produce with a modern twist, raising the challenge of rendering this traditional kitchen into a gourmet dining experience. Fadi, thank you for joining us and welcome to Africa. Thank you, Mickey, and thank you for hosting me. And I, I think Africa, I mean, you've done a great thing to present Africa scholastically, but I love Africa. So, you know, guys, just follow Africa. I, when you have any curiosity about the Arab world, my go to address is Africa usually. Thank uh, you so, so I'm much. I'm really happy to be with you guys. I'm so happy to have you here. Um, so I, I think the first place to start, Fadi, if it's okay with you, is where you're calling from. You're calling from Bethlehem. Yep, I'm calling from the middle of the old city of Bethlehem. So right now we're at where I live, which is which was built by my great 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 grandfather in 1838. Um, and I'm so lucky to be here because I am a minute and a half away from the market. I am two, three minutes away from where my restaurant is. And, and this is, for me, this is Bethlehem. This is like, you can't be more Bethlehem than this. So I'm curious for those of us who haven't had the privilege and pleasure to visit Bethlehem, how much was produce and sort of the farm, the quote unquote farm, a part of your daily life growing up? How well, Bethlehem is a, is a bit of a funny place because it's a small, I mean, officially it's a city, but in reality, it's a small, big village. So we're, we're 60,000 inhabitants in Bethlehem and 200,000 in the whole region of Bethlehem. Now, Bethlehem per se doesn't have a farming in the city, but farming around the city is extremely essential to the daily life of, of Bethlehem. So my, I mean, I'm just looking at the pictures and I think you've hired a spy to get a picture of my garden that actually looks better than this now. So the trees have grown a bit, but <laughs> um, I think this is very typical of Bethlehem. All family homes in Bethlehem had a garden where, I mean, for me, when you say a Palestinian garden, I just think a fig tree, an escadinia tree, a lemon tree, like they're like the quintessentials of any place and Palestinians in the diaspora, people who have even ended up in refugee camps have, you know, there's fabulous stories of people who have arrived in Lebanon, in Syria, in, in Jordan, in a camp. And the first thing they did was plant a fig tree or plant a, like, this is where the, the, the relation with produce is. But then for me, my experience is, comes really from, I mean, I keep talking about my grandmother's kitchen because that's really where I learned how to cook. But also, I would spend weekends, summer holidays so with my maternal grandmother and grandfather. And at the time, most farmers around Bethlehem, what they would do is they would come into the city with their produce, go to homes of people they knew would, would be their traditional clients. And then whatever wasn't sold at the homes would end up in the market. Um, so I have memories of being on this doorstep of my grandmother with a lady selling sabr, um, the prickly pears, and peeling them, and you know she spent an hour, and then somebody else coming in with little apples from the village south of Bethlehem called Beit Ummar. So like, there's this really bad rhythm of season, which then I tried to reproduce in my restaurant. Yeah. So I want to I I want to get to your restaurant and sort of um, the the some of the experiments and. Um, uh, deconstruction and reconstruction that you're doing. But before we get to that, I'm curious about the food that you grew up eating as a child. And before you answer the question, what I'm interested in is, do you feel like your grandmother, whose kitchen you, you just referred to, was also experimenting and was in a process of exploring what Palestinian food may be? Definitely, but it wasn't only Palestine, and that's where that's why I'm smiling because I think I my missing hits of experimenting really come from my grandmother. Like I have memories of her trying to do some bizarre jam with things that don't really work, and having a whole pot of things just 
end up not really being what she wanted, and then her transforming them into a pet de fruit and claiming it was good. So we all grandchildren had to just eat it and lump it. But you know, I but really I, I think I'm lucky to have on my paternal side a family that moved to Japan and then in 43 moved to India. My father was born in Bombay and then they came back to Bethlehem. On my mother's side, my grandfather was born in France and moved back to Bethlehem. And then we have a strong component of an Italian bit of the family. So the kitchen was a bit all of this, like my grandmother's kitchen, my mother's kitchen today, um, and is a bit of all these influences, but it's also trying to define Palestinian cuisine because, because of the seasonality I was describing earlier, I think the, the broad lines of what Palestinian cuisine are is the sea. I mean, when people ask me what is Palestinian cuisine, I just say it's the Palestinian terroir because that's really, it's silic and huerne in season, it's mlochia in season. And, and with your map uh, now up on the screen, it makes it even more complicated. So okay, yeah. this, this map is not realistic. Guys, yeah. imagine all of this and like try and imagine. Eight percent of this, because that's where we are allowed to move. So yeah. here, I'll just take one example, Nikki. Gaza. My uncle's wife is from Gaza. Last time I was in Gaza was in 1987. Yeah. So fish ended up not being anymore part of Bethlehem cuisine. But when I was a kid, Gaza Yafa were the sources of fish, and that's where we get them. Um, with the construction of the segregation wall, with life being more limited by occupation, all of that just becomes non-realistic. I mean, if I look at my kitchen at the restaurant, um, mm-hmm. when I get apprentices or, or people in the team that are younger, and especially people that have been born after 2000, um, they can't even visualize what it looks like. So yeah. a dish which is very present in Palestinian cuisine, Sayyadiyya Samak. You tell anybody in Bethlehem, in Nablus, and they have no idea what a Sayyadiyya Samak is. And if they do, yeah. it's done with a frozen fillet of fish, which is quite disgusting. So it's not, it's not a real Sayyadiyya. Like it, it, yeah. so the reality of this occupation has changed the geography of produce and, and how we deal with it. So yeah, I hope I... Yeah, no, that's I, that's exactly right. I, I mean, I wanted to bring in a, to bring in a map that um, that allowed us to sort of imagine the diversity and also um, think through some of the the realities and the um, the the constraints that that we have to live through. Um, but the other reason why I wanted to talk about this was I love um, thinking about sort of. Palestinian cuisine with a capital P, right? As if it is a single thing. And your series, Teta's Kitchen, which I highly recommend everybody explore, um, does an amazing job of breaking this down and looking at a, each different city um, and picking a picking a, um, a dish that may be representative of the city. So just to go through some of them, and then I want to ask you about them. So Things like uh, kusa mahshi, uh, anab, things like mlhi, uh, things like um, you also look at amsakhan, um, uh, you look at, a, at a, a bunch of different things. But in your mind, what is the first sort of like quintessential dish of the Palestine that you grew up in? There is no single dish. For me, it's mansaf because mansa for me means a lot. And it's like these memories of celebrations in the family where we had mansaf, but it's also, and again, it's my grandmother, it's a roasted lamb where nobody would want to, to touch the head of the lamb except my grandmother and I, and we'd be devouring the cheeks while everybody looks at us like, oh, you're savages. Um, I, now, you're showing Ma'luba, and I know that Ma'luba yeah. is very close to the heart of Palestinians. For me, Ma'luba is something that I adore, but it's very controversial because we all have a fight about ma'luba. Like, what do you do ma'luba? Do you do it with aubergines? Do you do it with cauliflower, chicken? But there's no like one single plate, but each plate has a story. So the first slide you showed yeah. of Bethlehem's Kusa Wara'inab. Why is it Bethlehem? It's because 
prior to, to 48, the majority of citizens in Bethlehem were of Christian faith. And what I end up was your Sunday dish. Because yeah. you would do it in the morning, put it on the fire, go to church, and while, when you come back, it's ready. Um, so for me, that was the association with Bethlehem. Um, when we chose those dishes for Tata's Kitchen, it was either things that were linked to the tradition of the city. So there are some that are just automatically associated, just like um, so stuffed lamb necks with Hebron, because that's like totally a Hebron dish, uh, which is the one you're showing now. In Sachan, in Sebastia, because we were olive picking in Sebastia. So um, I have a I have a question about the msachan in Sebastia. Um, is it always presented in this way? Across Palestine, it's presented differently. Yeah. So in the south of Palestine, like in Bethlehem, we don't do it this way. We do we do one bread that is a taboon bread per person with the onions, the chicken, the pine nuts. In the north of the West Bank, it's done this way with a layering of bread, onions, and then the chicken on top. Yeah. And how much olive oil you put is also a, a different thing. Now, of course, the Sebastian one, if for the ones who watched it, I was defied by one of the ladies I was cooking with. I love olive oil. I'm like, I, I could just drink olive oil all the time. And, and she yeah. said, oh, but you, you're putting a lot of olive oil. So the moment she walks out of the set, I just grabbed the thing and I dunked everything again in olive oil. And to be honest, it was the best msakhan I had in my life. So, um, as a, just as a point of cl clarification, the msakhan I've always had growing up has always sort of been like a pastry. Oh. Is that oh. completely different? No, that's not msakhan. That, like, you mean a, a roll of dough with some chicken and some mat in the middle? Yeah. And, uh, that is not msakhan. That's something I combat. Like, what is called msakhan rolls. Yeah. Where people very often use shrek bread and roll it into mzakhan, they're nice. I, I actually do do them sometimes, but I don't call them mzakhan because the whole idea of mzakhan is this soft bread that's really drunk, the broth of the chicken, the olive oil, the cement. It, it, it's that very um, leisurely experience. The, the little rolls are more yeah. of a crispy thing. I mean, I, I tend to call them a a cross between a um, msakhan ingredients and a chicken shawarma somewhere in the middle. Yeah, um, that's right. Mzakhan, for me, like, it's not msakhan. But then there's something else which is very important in msakhan, is your hands. You dunk your hands into the... Like, you basically take the bread and use the bread and onion to take a chunk of chicken in. And you have what we... There's a word in Arabic that can be translated as a mouthful, but it's, it doesn't really work as a mouthful. It's lu'ma. Lutma, which which describes something that, that doesn't exist, I think, anywhere else. Yeah. And Lutma is your like literally what you could grab. It's like a bite. It's a bite, but it's more, I think it's more poetic than, than a, yeah. <laughs> a, a bite. And and Sakhan is one of those dishes that needs your hands to, to be enjoyed. Yeah. Um it's like a munch. A munch. Yeah, a munch would be a bit better, maybe. Yeah. Like that. Okay. Look. Um uh, the, I had one question for you. As I was going through these episodes, I'm just going to switch through some of the slides just so people can see some of the images. Um, I was curious, none of the episodes focus on um, sort of part of the cold mezze or like a, a salad or a fatouche or a Are Do you feel like those are, was, was that a deliberate choice or was that, um, or did you, were you trying to focus on like tabikh? It was a deliberate choice for, for many reasons. One of the reasons is traditionally in, in Palestine, when you went out to a restaurant, that's where you had mezza and grilled meats. Mm -hmm. and, and prior to this, I'm going to try staying polite and, and say just the invasion of, of what people claim is international cuisine, just to stay polite. The only restaurant, like the emblematic restaurants in Palestine, were the places that were known for their mezzas and their grilled meats, chicken, mm. and so forth. Um, and all of the rest, the tabikh, was really homemade. Um, and when I started the thinking process of, of fauda and, and modernizing Palestinian cuisine, it's how do I actually 
get the flavors of the tabikh into a gourmet setting, onto a plate, basically, because all of these dishes are communal dishes. And, and for me, it was very important with the Tata's Kitchen to go back to the source. And the source, you know, some kitchens in, in Lebanon, for example, in 1929, there was a book written by Georges Reyes called La Cuisine Libanaise, which was a bit like the Bible of Lebanese cuisine. In Palestine, we didn't have this. Yeah. And it was oral tradition. So these ladies I was lucky to cook with across the country, they're the ones that, that guarded this tradition. Yeah. Um, so for me, it was also exploring. I mean, you're showing the mluchia, for example. Yeah. Um, mluchia is, I think, one of the most controversial dishes across the Middle East in general. And That's in true. Um, for the ones that are not mluchia fans, it's a dish you either hate or love. But then when you love it, it's a very ritualistic dish. Do you have onions and vinegar? Do you have onions yeah. and lemon? Do you have onions, garlic, and chili? Do you have fresh lemon on it? Do you have breadcrumbs on it or not? And, and so forth. And I think we all inherited this in our homes and in different places. Do, do you use kuzbara or not? Do you use coriander or not? Do you use yeah. it with, with rice or with bread? And, and that is really something that, that for me is, is this like fantastic dish. I've never talked to anybody about mlukhiya without getting people to like look at me with big eyes and be like, oh, it's disgusting. Or, oh, I love it. You know, my mother does it. Like, it's either yeah. or... But then there's also one thing which, which brings us back to the diversity of this region. Murukhiya was known in English as Jews Malo. And why is that? It's because the Jewish community from Alexandria, Egypt, when they went off to... Um, Europe, that's one of the dishes they cooked. So the Tunisian Jewish community cooks mulukhiya just like the other Tunisians. And I thought like mulukhiya is really one of the ones, uh, and if you actually look at my Instagram, I do tend to post a mulukhiya dish every few days, just to yeah. try and like tease people and see, okay, what are they going to be telling us? <laughs> you know, what's happening? Well, my joke about mulukhiya is it's not that if you, you either love it or hate it. It's you either love the one you're having and if you hate the one you're having, just try one of the many other ones until you figure out the, the version that you like. Because <laughs> I actually grew up hating my mom. Exactly. And I, I, thought, I thought, oh, I hate this dish. And then I went over to a friend's house and I had his mom's mukhiyah and I was like, oh, this is amazing. <laughs> um, well, you haven't tried my mukhiyah. I actually dehydrate the mukhiyah leaves or fry them. Wow. And, and I use them to decorate dishes, and I think they're fantastic. I'd like to talk a little bit about, uh, about the impetus for starting Fauda, and, which, is a, which is a great name for many different types of in, uh, restaurants. And so I'm curious why Fauda made sense for the restaurant that you were trying to start, and why did you start, why did you start it to begin with? Fauda. Fauda, for a simple reason, I don't have a menu in Fauda. I go to the market, what the farmers have that day dictates my menu, and it's a set menu. Um, so ah, you're, you're showing, for example, the roasted apple and black tahina cream. I buy my black tahina from a small grocery in Bethlehem. Um, when I go into Samer's shop and he doesn't have black tahina, I'm not doing a black tahina-based dessert. I mean, and that's how the menu happens. So that's why I follow up. And because I really think this chaos does lead to creation. Um, and and a day you have to create a new menu, like literally every day. It's not you're doing a set menu or you're doing a menu that you're going to change every three months over the season. It's like every morning, it's a challenge. <clears throat> when you see a beautiful what it's a sand like this one with the liver, you're going to use it that day. Why did I start it? Basically, the, where we're located, it's a Hosh Sirian guest house. It was an old building that was renovated by the Italian government in support of Bethlehem municipality. And they were looking for somebody to manage it. And I ended up taking over the place. Um, and I thought, you know, I've always wanted to do something with my, my attempts to modernize Palestinian food. 
and this is the most fantastic location because I can also take people. Uh, funny picture you just saw that was before, showed uh, that was before we got our industrial kitchen. So we started with like home equipment. Uh, if you look yes. at the gases in the back, they, you just remind. I mean, the, the table is a industrial table. Like the gases in the back were not even yet the the, the the like the professional ones. And I started like this um, because that was really important for me is to really get Bethlehem on the food map. And I think we were quite lucky over the five and a half, six years of operations where we got people's attention about you know, what we were dishing up in our plates. And, and, and I think that was, I mean, I, I would ever, ever be grateful for that opportunity. Yeah, I mean, uh, you've, yeah, I think it's an understatement to say that you've, you've gotten a little attention. You've gotten a, a lot of attention. A little attention. I'm, I'm curious about the relationship with the, uh, the restaurant to the neighborhood more broadly. Um, and and the, the neighborhood physically, sort of this like social geography, but also um, to the, the society, uh, the, the people, the inhabitants. How, what is the relationship between um, the sort of the, the guest house, the, the food that is being made, the restaurant itself to the folks locally? Now, the folks locally it depends who. If we're talking about the farmers, the butcher, the um, spice master, it, it's a fantastic. Okay, so Ibn Nabil, Ibn Nabil, there. Ibn Nabil is the best example. Ibn Nabil is somebody. When I go down to the market, she's not. She wasn't there a few days ago, and I got like dead worried and had to call half of the people in her family. And she was just not feeling like coming to the market that day. Ibn Nabil is where I start my day. It's having that discussion. Here, for the purpose of the picture, I was not sitting on the stairs because the Ibn Abid was like, you know how old Palestinian women are like, hey, Habibi, the stairs are dirty. You shouldn't sit on them. But yeah. I usually sit on the stairs and we have a long chat about the produce she has and what I'm going to be doing with them. In the beginning, she would just look at me like an alien. She'd be like, what? You're going to fry those mukhiyadis? You're nuts. And then, and then it, like, it became like much more of a... Uh, of a real relationship of exchange. Um, yeah. Now, with the guests we have, the, the local guests, <laughs> it's very complicated, to say the least. Yeah. Um, the majority of guests we have are not locals. Um, they're either expats that are based here or tourists that are staying at the guest house or people actually driving you know, from wherever they're, they're staying. Um, the ones that um, we have from local community, it's a hit or miss. I get like, I think one of my worst stupid advisor reviews was somebody saying uh, that I was a horrible person who just served her uncooked meat. But I am not ready to, because we, we started aging beef. Nobody aged beef before. And I'm lucky to have this fabulous butcher. And we started with them aging beef. I will not burn a piece of beef that's been aged for 45 days with love and caring. I will not serve it. Well done. Um, yeah. And, and um, so these are like, this is one of the examples. Or sometimes people just look at the dish. And I, I always use this example because it, it was one of my marking memories in the beginning. I had done an Amish bush with literally the first peas that had come into season in Palestine, like literally the first kilo of peas in the whole country was in, in my kitchen. And I served a few of them raw and a few of them blanched with a bit of raw salt, a bit of pepper, um, and a reduction of dibbas, so great molasses. And one of the guests asked the, the head waiter to go get me from the kitchen. So I went off to see them. It's somebody I know um, who had, he was an older gentleman, and he said, look, what is this? You're making fun of us. I'm like, but please, let's just taste that pea. And, and he said, no, you know, this is ridiculous. Like, this is a raw pea. I, because I knew him, I allowed myself to do it. I grabbed the pea and shoved it in his mouth. And the guy just went like, wow. I was like, I've just sent you back 70 years. Right yeah. when you were a kid and you were in your grandmother's garden, he's like, Yes, I, was like, yeah, I didn't do anything, 
And, and that's for me very important. But look, this picture is fantastic because without Ibn Nabil, I don't exist as a chef. Yeah. Without farmers, without artisans, we don't exist. And, and so, that for me is something I really want to. No, I, on that on that point, um, precisely, I'm curious over the time, at both from when you were a child to when you started the restaurant, have you seen um, differences or trends in the, the quality of the produce or the types of produce that are even available when you sit down because of maybe uh, environmental changes, um, but also obviously changes in water supply because of the occupation, changes in um, movement? Are there, are there structural things that you're seeing um, on a day-to-day -day basis when you sit down with her? Do you know what zarur is? Yeah. Zarur is that little uh, fruit that we use to do jam. And zarur would be in, in season. Now is the zarur season. You'd find zarur all over Palestine. Yeah. This year, I am hunting for zarur. There's, no, there's none. Why? Because of the control of water by occupation, because we as Palestinians have also become more and more detached. You know, a lot of the farming society that I knew when I was young have moved to more of an urban professional class. Yeah. And, and that has changed the relation. I'll take one example. Again, you're keeping Ibn Abir in front of me. So I'll take Ibn Abir as an example. Yeah. She comes from a village called Artas, south of Bethlehem. That was historically known to be a bit the, the lush garden of Bethlehem. Um, biblically, if we take the biblical text as a historic text, that's where Solomon wrote the Song of Songs. So the only text in the Bible that is not religious. It's, it's more, um, you know, nature and, and a love bit. Um, in the Valley of Ertaz, you have every family from the village has a plot of land and they have all wells of water that are fed from the water coming up from the little hill behind it. Today, that hill has a settlement on it. The water doesn't come down anymore because it's being yeah. taken by these Israeli settlers. But also, all the people in the village that used to be farmers, most of them are working as construction workers in Israel or working with professional jobs in, in, in Bethlehem. And, and that's where that has changed. Movement is, I gave you earlier the example of fish. When I was a kid, yeah. we used to have access to fish. With the segregation wall, you know, I mean, there is one fishmonger in Bethlehem that still gets fish from Jaffa, but it's totally irregular. Um, we used to get fish from, from Gaza. It, it's been yeah. since the way before the blockade, actually, since the, the closure of Gaza, of physical checkpoints, it has totally changed the access. Uh, of, of fish. Um, and then on the global scale, today you have more and more farming land being used for export. And we're getting things like tarragon being planted in the north of the West Bank, while in Palestinian cuisine, we don't really use tarragon. Um, so th there's, a lot, there's a bit of that shift towards export. Again, at the, in that picture, if you look at, on the right of Ibn Nabil, there's a cardboard box in red. Mm -hmm. And that's a vegetable box with Hebrew written on it. So Ibn Abil's products are not Israeli, but she uses the cartons that she finds around to put her produce. Yeah. And those boxes are very often given to Palestinian farmers by an Israeli um, company buying their produce. So they're already packed into their boxes or vice versa, products coming from, from Israel into, into the West Bank markets, um, you know, things like shiny tomatoes that are coming out from a massive farming exploitation. So th that has changed the whole reality, definitely. Yeah. Okay, I want to jump to the single ingredient. So part of the Matbakh series, we've asked every single guest to choose either a single ingredient, um, uh, recipe, pro uh, technique, or dish. And for yours, you chose some map. And so, Tell us a little bit about why you chose this ingredient and why um, you, you've been thinking about it recently. <laughs> Look, I, I'm so obsessed with Sumat that 
um, when my butcher wants to be nice to me, he comes from the Hebron area originally, and so Matt in Palestine grows a lot in Hebron. When he wants to be nice to me, um, he, he, I see him with a grin and a bag in his hand. I'm like, oh, you've been to Matt farming. Um, but also, there's a, there's a Jordanian chef called Nujud Saadeddin, who's a, who's a very good friend. She actually calls me Summa. So she doesn't even call me Fadi. I'm obsessed with Summa. Why recently I've been thinking about Summa? I think Summa is the most underrated spice in, in general in Arab cuisine. Yeah, you posted this today. I love this post. Yeah, I. Okay. This is. I, I just did a confit with these vegetables. So, again, my obsession with olive oil. These were covered with olive oil. They went into the oven at 65 degrees for five and a half hours. Um, but what you see there is za'atar and summa, fresh za'atar. Um, summa for me is really the, the. If I had to choose one spice that says Palestine, I would cho- choose summa and not yeah. za'atar even though za'atar is much more used. But I think sumat has this like finesse of, it's a very, if, if you've cooked with sumat, um, sumat is a very fine spice. It's not overpowering. It's not chili. It's not allspice. It's not nutmeg that gives you a wham. It, but delicate and that tanginess that, that pe- people sometimes say, oh, but... I, I feel um, something that is lemony. It's not lemony. It's acidity um, of some which is very particular. <coughs> Why I also uh, have used some it's because I've recently done a fig jam with some and I, I fell in love with using some mat with, with, with sweets also. Um, yeah, Andrea, I, I'm sorry, I'm seeing the questions. Andrea, yeah. you know me too well. Stop saying any sweet stuff with Suma. You know, Andrea, you have the recipe of the thick jam. So Andrea is a good friend in Chile. And she, <laughs> she knows what's happening. Um, yes, I, Suma, I, I use it in all its shapes. So basically, the prior picture you had with the grain, yeah. like the, the, the bays, um, once they're dry, I use them dry on that, like that whole shape. Yeah. I use it to decorate a plate. I use them where I soak them overnight and use the juice of them to make sauce reductions. Uh, we have a traditional Palestinian recipe from Gaza called Sumaiya, where you mm. cook chard in that juice of Suma and then you finish it with paniya. T- it's fabulous. Um, and it's actually on one of the Teta kitchen. It's the Teta kitchen from Gaza. We cook that Sumaiya. That's uh, true. That's true. I, but then Suma is, you know, Suma is one of the spices that you, there's the Suma here. Um, Suma is one of the spices you can use raw or in a cooked preparation. And funnily enough, when I was talking about my family, one of the things I learned from the, their passage to India is to fry spices for them to release the flavor. Suma is maybe the only spice that burns when you fry it. Mm. It doesn't release its flavor. So it works very well in a liquid. It works very well um, raw it, in a cooked stew and in, in roasted things, but never frying it in oil to, to give it that release. It, it loses, it just burns. Interesting. And okay. again, the last reason, sorry, the last reason why some because I'm yeah. fed up of seeing fake some all over the place. When you're in the US, in Europe, in, in some Arab countries, you see these fantastic jars of red powder called summa. Guys, summa is not red. Summa is a very deep burgundy brown. If you see summa that's red. So this, these the are powder, wrong. These are wrong. Fat, no, no. These are the right colors. Okay. If you look at it, I mean, obviously the one on the left, somebody's been playing with exposure. Yeah. <laughs> but if, if you look at it, uh, Mickey, that's you, right? It's one of it, it's you doing this, I'm sure. Um, but look at the one on the right. That is the right color. It's not yeah. red. It has that tint of Bordeaux. And when you cook with it, it doesn't give you a, a red. Yeah, liquid. it looks like this. 
it looks like this exactly bah. okay let's do a quick round of q a uh quick q a's and then we're going to open up to the the chat so i'm going to try to cut you off off after a um a minute okay. so what are you reading or watching right now i'm reading bread massimo batura's book um i am watching refectorios again massimo it's be, it's just because we, we it, it's something that is very dear to my heart right now food waste i think this okay. pandemic has told us a lot about food waste and it's time we we start really working on food waste i agree okay who would you love to shadow for a day past or present <sighs> I, I studied hotel management in a school called the Institut Vettel in Paris. Vettel was the cook of the of Fouquet, the intendant of the king. And on an evening where the king was supposed to come and have dinner, they found him in the kitchen. The guy stabbed himself in the heart because the fish delivery was late and he couldn't imagine not serving fish to the king. I would love shadowing Vettel for a day before he stabs himself. <laughs> Crucially. <laughs> Because I do think, yeah. the, I think the kitchen, like we all, chefs come across as nice people usually, um, but re in reality in kitchens, it, it, order is very important. I can't be doing fauda and splashing a beetroot sauce on a plate if what led to it was not order. And I think yeah. that was like the foundation of order in the kitchen. Yeah. What is your guilty pleasure uh, midnight food choice? Can I have more than one choice? Yeah, sure. Cold malfouf from the fridge. Me too. Heck. Heck. <laughs> exactly. With a bit of lemon, extra lemon on it. <laughs> um, kaik, so the, the sesame bread with prosciutto and butter. Oh, wow. That is like... And, and then chocolate. Um, I don't know if my mother is watching this. Maybe she is. One of the many things I inherited from her, we wake up at two in the morning and mm -hmm. we have coffee, plain chocolate, and a cigarette. Every night. Okay. What dish reminds you most of home? Wow. Um, My mother's mansa. Yeah. My grandmother's Clementine Givray. And eggs fried in Samna with Samna. Uh, Ayoun? Ayoun, of course. Yeah. Okay, perfect. That's my favorite breakfast, by the way. Okay, let's open it up to QA. Um, we have uh, a few questions in the chat. Please limit it to one question each. Um, the first one, it seems like Martin's not here. The first one will be from Hannah. Um, okay, her question is, um, I've always wondered this, has there ever been a history of pork dishes within the Christian Palestinian community? I live in Italy now, completely appreciate your Italian Palestinian fusion dishes. I now lazily make msakhan using focaccia, don't hate me. <laughs> okay. Uh, Hannah, I, first, Pork has always been present in Palestine, um, not only eaten by the Christian community. Um, so, yes, there's been, I mean, Sunday for a lot of people means a pork barbecue. And recently I, I did, um, I, I got some sausages from my pork butcher. They're very Palestinian. Like all the spices in those sausages is Palestinian. Um, and that's something like you smell, you walk around Bejala, Bethlehem, Bethlehem on a Sunday and you smell that like sausage being grilled. Um, so yes, it's very present. At my restaurant, part of my Christmas menu is a long, slow roasted leg uh, of pork, a ham with local spice, with aniseed, with za'atar, um, and... We're in the service industry. I've never asked somebody what their faith is when they're coming into a restaurant. The, the answer is there for you, I think. 
Perfect. Okay, so uh, two questions that they asked me to read. So one is from Tanya, just really quickly. Who was the author of that book, um, La Cuisine Libanais? George Reyes. George Reyes. The second one is the, the Martin one that he skipped, and I'm going to be a little more specific. His question was, what is the major difference between Palestinian cuisine and Middle Eastern cuisine more uh, broadly? I'm going to be a little more specific. If you were to identify what is uh, most different about uh, like cuisine from Gaza to Egyptian cuisine and cuisine from the north of Palestine to Lebanese cuisine, like the neighboring countries, what are sort of some of the switches, if any? Um, to the, the Martin from Miami, Martin, Martin, somebody I know well. So I, I know where the question comes from. Martin, it's a bit like we share a lot in common with our neighboring countries, definitely. Um, the Lebanese kitchen, the Palestinian kitchen, the all, all of the region has had two commonalities. One is the shared terroir and the produce, but also we were ruled for 400 years by the Ottomans. And that history of an empire means food traveled within the empire. And very often, um, I've had a, past, a really interesting discussion with a Japanese food writer called Ryoko Segushiki, and we compared a bit the Ottoman cuisine to the uh, Japanese cuisine and the whole idea of an empire, where even within regional diversities in Japan, the food went into the emperor's kitchen and then was redeveloped. You know, ma'luba, for example, which is a very Palestinian dish, the story is that the name Matluba was given to, to the dish by an Ottoman uh, official because he had tasted that dish in a Palestinian village. And then he came back a year later and wanted that same dish, but he couldn't remember what it is. So he described it and said, Matluba, it's the thing you flip over. And the name stuck. <laughs> but, but our cuisine, how is it different? we don't do kushari like the Egyptians. And even in Gaza, we don't do kushari. But then Gaza does knafa, which is called knafa arabiya, that has no cheese in it. In Bethlehem, we do knafa that also has no cheese, but it's very different. Mm. So the one, the one in Gaza has a lot of nuts, um, and it looks like, like it's a flat um, semolina sweet. The one in Bethlehem are vermicelli that are cooked with they're cooked on steam. There is some cinnamon on them, walnuts, and syrup. And then um, in Nablus, there's the knafe and nablusia with the yeah. cheese. So, so these are the differences, and they can become like dish specific. Yeah. Um, we talked about mluchia earlier. I don't think any Lebanese family would do mluchia like we do it here. They just look at us like, what? You, you use non-fresh mluchia leaves, not whole. You know, so that, these are the differences, really. <laughs> Um, okay, so the next question is from Tomara, who I'm going to read her question. Um, her question was, uh, again, I'm going to change it a little bit. It's what is the Palestinian pr produce or dish that you're most passionate about um, and feel you can present in a gourmet dining setting? I feel like there's probably a lot of them. I'm going to flip the question around a little bit. What Palestinian dish do you feel is a sacred lamb and you don't feel comfortable deconstructing, changing, and sort of uh, messing with? I don't believe in dogma. I feel comfortable in messing with everything. Um, but I, what can be presented in a, in a for the original question, um, all Palestinian dishes can be presented in a gourmet setting. Um, I really enjoy, you know, tackling the sacrosanct, msakhan. Msakhan, in my version, became a chicken liver pate with the same flavors and a onion and some jam and a mini tabun. But when you, Sorry? Yeah. I was hoping I had the image. I don't have it, yeah. Leban um, Jamid, if, if it's a produce... For the question uh, of the produce, it's Leban Janid. Leban Janid for me is is like is as holy as Summa and and Zatar. Um, 
With the lemon jamid here, for example, I use it dry. You know, usually we rehydrate lemon jamid to make mensap and shishbarak, but here I just use it dry, I crumble it, or I shave it on top of a soup, in this case, a cream. Uh, but I use it with salads. I've cooked lemon jamid into a dry produce. Actually, when, I'll tell you a confession, when Mickey asked me what product you want to talk about, um, Omar Sartaw is a very good friend of mine, and Omar is the one who started the series last week. And Omar, like, really worked around lemon jamid. So we had this discussion of, like, I actually called Omar, like, Omar, are you doing lemon, or should I do some, like, which one should we do? Um, but I'll, and to just summarize it, when I travel in my bag, I have suma, za'atar leaves, mistaka, which is Arabic gum, mm -hmm. always. These for me, with these three, I can do a Palestinian meal anywhere. Amazing. Okay, two questions left. Uh, Marcella, you're unmuted. Go for it. Cool. Um, hi, Fadi. I'm actually a Bethel Bethlehemite. I had to insert, I think your grandfather delivered my father, but I have to wow. confirm that. <laughs> yeah, I, I've been watching your videos and I was just wondering, like, given the current situation um, and obviously the over riding political situation like what is the best way to support palestinian you know producers like the olive oil man you featured i think that was sebastia um or like people selling you know the regular producers doing palest um keeping the palestinian cuisine alive and then obviously chefs like yourself um given the situation but also the added situation of covid where tourism is harder and um yeah wow. uh, well thank you for the question and yes please check if my grandfather delivered your, your father. I think he did, because my, my father sent me the videos of your shows, and he was like, and his grandfather delivered me, so I'm pretty sure it's true, but I can follow up with that. <laughs> I, I love that. I'm this, Aburdena Bendak. Ah, okay. So you're Aburdena Bendak. How can you preserve this? Well, Bendaks, you started preserving culture 100 years ago. The first newspaper in Bethlehem was started by a Bendak who was also mayor of the city. So, That's my great-grandfather. <laughs> voila, voila. <laughs> so your answer is there. Um, how can you go on supporting? Yeah. Look, I, I think there's one thing that is really, really important, and it's getting our voices out there. Getting our voices out there with the reality of what we are. And the reality of what we are is the diversity of Palestine. Is your great-great-grandfather starting a newspaper in Bethlehem? Is the first two people to put music to film in the Arab world being Bethlehemites? Is, is what, you know, all of that history. Um, supporting producers today, um, Palestinian olive oil, Palestinian zaatar. Look, I, I rarely endorse brands because it's very tricky. Mm -hmm. um, but for example, in the UK, I work very closely with Zaytun, um, not only because I think they're a fantastic team, but because I've tried all of their products. I've cooked with their products I've, and, and not a paid for cooking. Like, I don't believe in this, honestly. Um, now I'm doing something with, with a Jordanian based but Palestinian um, company again. So really what you're comfortable with in terms of the produce you, you can use at home, that remind you of Bethlehem in your case, but if anywhere in Palestine, yeah. that's great. Um, and what we need to do is also not fall into the traps that are being set for us. Um, the traps, i.e., our cuisine is being stolen. We, we didn't talk about culinary appropriation because I think that'll need another 10 hours, but um, there are some battles that are worth it, and there are some that are just not worth it. Mm. And we should really fight the ones that are worth it. I, I, I went to, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example. I was very proud a few weeks ago when a friend of mine based in London did a Shabbat Shala with Zatar mm. that I had given her. Mm -hmm. And she was very careful in saying a Jewish Shabbat Shala, not an Israeli Shala, a Palestinian Zatar. And I thought this, this sent me back to the Palestine I didn't know, but my grandparents knew, before the creation of a single racist state, Israel, where Palestinians were Muslims, Jews, Christians, and Samaritans. Um, and I was very much touched by some people that reached out asking about this diversity, but I was also very offended by people from both sides 
being extremely aggressive about it. Mm. I think the way we can preserve Palestinian identity, whether it's in cuisine and arts and culture, is actually by defending the real Palestine with all of its diversity. Jerusalem has communities that go from the African Jerusalemites to the people that are descendants of the Crusaders and everything in between and everything different. We have Azerbaijanis that came in as, as Sufi um, wise men and stayed in Jerusalem. We have gypsies in Jerusalem. This is that's Palestine I want to celebrate. Absolutely. Um, thank you, Marcella. Thank uh, Fadi, I, I think you just signed up for another talk in the future on the appropriation <laughs> conversation. Whatever you want. <laughs> okay. Um, I think we have time for one last uh, question. Suhaib, are you there? Okay. I'll ask one of, uh, or actually, you know, Hadid has been very patiently waiting. Hadid, do you want to ask your question? Yes. Hi, Mikey. Hi, Fadi. Hi. Hi. Uh, I wanted to ask you specifically about uh, heirloom indigenous plants um, and uh, fruits and varieties of fruits and vegetables that are indigenous to Palestine. How can people like yourself help preserve these heirloom varieties and help farmers continue to grow them? With farmers, my philosophy is based on two things. One, I never pre-order produce. Well, and we're, I'm saying farmers, but it's farmers and foragers. Um, I don't say I need for tomorrow 100 kilos of whatever, za'atar. Um, it's to me, and as I was saying earlier, without the imnabils of Palestine, we wouldn't exist as chefs. Um, it's for me to adopt and not the other way around. I think part of why, in a lot of countries, not only Palestine, heirloom um, vegetables, fruits, and, and naturally foraged uh, herbs and, and, and things like kuv and, and so forth have, have disappeared um, or being are threatened of disappearing is because they were driven to an excessive usage of them. Um, we can preserve as chefs by actually being respectful of that nature, um, first of all, because if not, at the end, we'll end up without Zafar in Palestine, we'll end up without Sunnah, and we'll end up, like now we're seeing, without Zarur. Um, the other thing is awareness, and, and that's something we lack um, in Palestine, is a system to help us. For example, if I take, the one I know the best is the French system, which is the, I would say, the, appellation, the origin appellation, we don't have a system like this. So basically, if, even if we look at olives, the native indigenous olives and the what we call in, in general Arabic, Zetun Rumi, because they were planted by the Romans, that there's nothing in terms of regulation to protect them, preserve them. Um, and that also applies, so we, we start from the heirloom uh, vegetables and, and, and fruits, but then we go off to finished products. It's a whole chain, it's a whole way of thinking that has to go across all the chain. And we need to be able to contribute to that as, as chefs, of course. Great. Um, thank you for the last question. Fadi, this has been a huge pleasure. Um, my, my, my heart is full and my mouth is watering. Uh, <laughs> So I, I, have, I have you to blame for that. Um, this was a lot of fun. Thank you to everyone who joined the talk. Um, I think this is a, a fantastic start to um, ongoing conversation. I hope we can continue that conversation in the future. We have another event um, tomorrow with Adib Dada talking about Beirut refor uh, reforestation efforts in urban centers or across the region. Um, there's an event on Saturday, community presentation, and then next week there's a whole another week filled with events. If you don't already subscribe to our YouTube channel and our podcast, please do so, so that you can see um, all the different events that you miss and you can catch up on them. Okay, everybody, take care. Enjoy your night or day, wherever you are. Thank you.